This morning, one of the key verses that I looked at was a, a verse that comes right after the qualifications of elders in 1 Timothy 3. That's where the church is described as the pillar and ground of the truth, that, that the church, the body of Christ, we are the stewards, the caretakers of truth, and that we are, uh, we are separated from the world and distinct from the world because of that. In Jesus' prayer right before he's arrested, when he's in the upper room with the twelve, one has just left, um, the eleven, uh, he is praying to them in chapter 17, and in particular in verse 17, John 17, 17, he says, sanctify them, praying to the Father, sanctify them. I mean, separate them, make them distinct from others by your truth. And then he specifies your word is truth. And so we have, we have Jesus himself stating in this prayer that what is right or what is true is God's word. That what he has revealed to us by inspiration is what defines what is true. In Psalm 30, 33 and verse 4, the psalmist says, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. The idea that the, the inspired word of God is both true and that it, it establishes absolute truth, the absolute right and absolute wrong that can be found or stated in reality itself, we find within Scripture. You find this theme all throughout Scripture. Isaiah 5, verse 20, um, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Because there is an absolute standard for what is right or what is true, then anything that deviates from that would be called false. Or would, another way to describe it is that it's ungodly. If truth is, it flows out of the very essence of who God is, then anything that's not true is ungodly. Now, what I want to look at this evening is something that I've discussed, oh, maybe it's, it's maybe been a decade ago, but I wanted to look at it because it's very fairly relevant today as we are in particular looking at, in this morning's lesson in particular, looking at the necessity for leaders within the church to have a firm grasp of truth. And in particular, what that means is to have a good relationship with reality as it is set by God. And one of the primary discussions that is important for us to be able to exercise in our minds is this. That's the difference or the study, the discussion between the, the, the difference between ethics and values. A lot of times we hear these used interchangeably. A lot of times we hear the word value used when it actually means ethics. A lot of times we hear the word ethics used when really it means values. And sometimes we hear the word ethics used and it's just used incorrectly or it's meant actually antithetical to true ethics. Whenever I hear in politics there's an ethics investigation, I always kind of laugh because I'm thinking, what do these people have know anything about ethics? Or in particular, what do they know about reality? And so let's let's separate these and let's look at what each of them means. An ethic is a moral standard and it's a moral standard that flows from the very essence of who God is in his nature. That's why I go back to the refrain of we need to know who God is. When we understand who God is and how he does things, how he interacts with his creation, the standards that he has set, then we will understand ethical reality. We will understand absolutes, we will understand what is right and wrong. We will understand what is godly and, and, and ungodly. And this has to do with morality. These are absolute moral things. I have a list here, and it's interesting that in, in this list of what you might call absolutes, absolute morality, I think only one of them is one that everybody agrees on. And there probably are, are some who are twisted enough in their thinking, but I mean as as a social convention is sometimes what morality is called by those who who come from a, an evolutionary uh, secular progressive standpoint they will tell you that morality is not absolute that is a social convention in other words 
it, it is the agreed upon morality of the population and that it changes over time. That's why you, when you think of, well, things are different than they used to be. Yeah, that's because their perspective is that morality is malleable, that it can change over time. Just about the only one that is agreed upon is rape. I have on my list murder, but under the right circumstances, that is not. Um, if, if someone believes that abortion is okay, then they do not believe that murder is an absolute ethic. They just don't. I have down here stealing. You would think that stealing would be an absolute moral ethic, right? Except that under what you might think of as a, just to be real direct, a Marxist redistributionary mindset, there's no such thing as private property. As, as is established in the book of Acts with Ananias and Sapphira. Remember what Peter says? He says, when you had the money, it was yours to do with what you wanted to. We have it established in Scripture that there's such thing as private property. There are those, and probably millions of those, and many of them that are your friends who don't even believe in private property. They think it's okay to take your stuff. Especially if you're privileged in some way, right? So even stealing is not an absolute moral. Murder isn't. Rape is about the only one. I have, and this is laughable, sexual immorality. Uh, how many people believe, that, believe in the absolute uh, moral ethic of uh, that, that fornication or adultery is wrong? Um, more, probably, to, to guess, at least half of the population doesn't see anything wrong with either of those. They would say, well, it's wrong if you're going to hurt somebody or don't get caught and that kind of stuff, right? That's what they would say. Another one that is laughable to think of those who would view, which is, these are all absolute moral ethics from God that I'm stating, but our culture is able to find, to see them and to twist them in some way. What about lying? Is lying an absolute moral ethic? Yes, yes it is. Uh, and yet... It, it is, is justified in so many different occasions. Um, it, it's just mind-boggling. A, a value as opposed to an ethic, a value is just what's important to me. Or a value is what's important to you. Um, you could think of it as your, your comfort zone. It's, it's the way you, you prefer things. It's the way you like things. Um, a value can be based on God's standard or not. Everyone that lives has values. Now, what's interesting about this is, is that, for the most part, I would say, everyone that has a value, to an extent, identifies the moral aspect of that as their ethic. But that's a misuse of the word ethic if their value deviates from God's word in some way. And so it would be an unethical moral value. And that's easy to find if you just look at the different ways that different, different religious groups do things. The disagreement that they have and the deviation from scripture. They would value something and they would say it's their religious ethic when in fact it's a deviation from the moral absolute. And so when it comes to right and wrong, God has already determined what is absolute, what is reality. And you might even say that ethics are God's values. That what God's values are, are what sets the moral ethic for the world, for us. And that each individual has their own value system that may or may not follow from God's values or God's ethic. I was in, I was thinking about this today. I was in a class and it was literally 20 years ago, like probably this month, and I can't believe I'm that old. Uh, I was in grad school 20 years ago in contemporary ethics. That was my class. And it wasn't taught by a secular progressive atheist 
uh, or something. It was taught by a preacher, a Christian, uh, but he would chew us up and spit us out. If we even said the right thing, he would tell us why it was wrong. And then when we got, he would do that in front of the class. And then when we got, he got done chewing us up and spitting us out, then he would tell everybody why what he was saying was wrong and how to defend it. That's the kind of class it was. It was terrifying. His name is Ralph Gilmore, if you've ever heard that name before. One of the most brilliant minds I've ever, ever sat under. But one of the earliest discussions I can remember of the difference between ethics and values is in this class. And I'll never forget that in those classes, those classes were three hours long because you only met one time a week. And so sometimes a teacher would take a break every hour or sometimes you would take a break at the hour and a half mark. And usually what we would do is, is we would, uh, it was like on the third floor, I think, of this building. And on the, in the basement, they had a vending, or they had a few vending machines down there. And a few of us would crowd into the elevator and go down and we would get a Coke. And I remember one day I got this 20 ounce bottle of Coke. There's nothing as refreshing as ice cold Coke, right? That was in my early years. Now it would be a Diet Coke. And I paid good money for this thing and it came out. And I grabbed it and it wasn't cold. And it wasn't lukewarm. It was hot. It was actually hot. Somehow or another, we had timed it perfectly that when he took the break and we came down to the elevator and we got the drinks, that the vending machine guy had just left. And he had just loaded up this Coke that had been like in some hot truck somewhere or sitting out in the sun for hours. And I opened it and I took a little sip of this hot Coke and I looked at my friend and I said, is this a value or is this an ethical issue? Now, that really helps us to understand, right? It isn't ethical whether or not your steak is well done or medium rare. You know who you are if you like it well done. I would like to say that's an ethical issue if you get your steak well done, all right? Because you need to have it medium rare. That's the best way to eat it. If it's well done, that, I, that almost feels like a sin to me. But we understand that it's not, and I say that in jest, in the same way that a Coke that is hot is not really a moral issue. And that helps us to understand that there's a sort of a dividing line in our value system. On the one hand, there's all these things that we just kind of prefer, that I like, that I, that I really want my drink to be cold and my steak to be medium rare. On the, other end, on the other hand, there are those values that are tied to morality. And they either are derived from or deviate from the absolute ethics that God has set. So I want us to look at a few concepts here. The first is this. is just because I value something doesn't mean that it's right. Just because something is right to me doesn't make it right. We hear this term, terminology uh, of your own, your own truth. This is my truth, and that's your truth. There aren't any different versions of the truth. There's only one truth. It's derived from God. God has established absolutes, and they are always right. Uh, any, of you, any of you seen the movie, Some Love It, Some Hate It, The Village? Anyone ever seen that? It's a movie about this village of people in like the 1600s or something like that. And, uh, and it's kind of weird. You're trying to figure out what's going on in this movie and somebody gets sick. And so they send a girl, they send a girl who is blind on purpose. They send a girl who is blind to go to the next village to get some medicine. And she runs into a fence. And the fence goes in both directions as far as she can tell. And so she climbs over the fence. And when she climbs over the fence, there's a highway on the other side and a car stops. And I think a park ranger gets out and says, who in the world are you, right? And what happened was there was this community of people who when they were young and they were hippies, decided that they were going to the woods and have their own civilization apart from the evil world. And they raised their kids to think that they lived in the, like the 1600s. All right. What if I grew up in a community like that, say in South Central Alabama, and I was told that it actually was the Confederate States of America. And we actually had Confederate money. We were actually using that Confederate money and 
And one day they sent me to get medicine, and I'm, all of a sudden I realize we're in civilization, right? It's, it's not the uh, 1860s anymore. And I started using that Confederate money. Would they take it? Does it matter that I think, oh, this is actually has some sort of monetary value to it? No, they're going to say, uh, no, that, that doesn't uh, have any value because that's not real because you've been lied to. Now, it might have some value to a collector or to a museum, but monetary value? No, it does not. It doesn't matter how much I have been convinced that it is true. It doesn't matter if I was raised that way. It doesn't make it true because it's not derived from an absolute truth. Many people value things of the world. First John 2.15, and we're going to look at the end of this passage towards the end of the lesson. In 1 John 2.15, uh, John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what, is this, what does this mean in, in the context of values versus ethics? Well, God has established the absolute values of particular things. Or he has deemed some things to have value and other things not to have an ethical value to them. Well, to love the world and the things in the world is to ascribe value or to find value in things that God has not deemed valuable. Or that yes, you should value or devote yourself to that particular thing, that thing then becomes an idol. We have elevated the value of that thing to a greater extent than what God has valued it. Which means that our value system has deviated from his ethical standard. In 1 Corinthians 8, 4, I love what's one of my favorite passages, talking about meat offered to idols. Paul says, therefore, concerning the eat, eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol, that's just, you know, statue, uh, wood, stone, metal, he says, we know that an idol is nothing in this world and that there is no other God but one. So the absolute is, well, this doesn't have any eternal value to it. It isn't even real. And yet when we put a value on something that has no eternal value to it, we tie ourselves to it, we elevate it in our minds, it becomes the same thing. We are doing, we are doing what they did, we just aren't calling it religious idolatry even though it is we are have our value system out of whack values tend to have strong emotional ties to them the things that we value and and let me let me just tell you this is about evaluating our values values are not wrong but they are tied to a lot of times uh, a deep uh, emotional place within us the things that we value uh, medium rare steak very emotional about that hot coca-cola very emotional about that all right it's not even not just moral ethics it's all, all not only moral values but all values we we are emotional about these things because they mean something to us that's what it means to value something a value can be attached to the conscience Usually it is in some way, especially if we consider it to be a moral value. A value can also be motivated by the flesh. And that's what John means about when he says, don't love the world or the things in the world. That we have a value system that can be motivated by flesh, which means we're setting ourselves up for failure because not only can the flesh never be satisfied, but the things that satisfy the flesh are only temporary. They're not eternal. In contrast to values, ethics are objective. They're definite. They're definitive. They're not subject to my emotions. But emotions certainly flow from an ethic. I, I, I do not believe that Jesus is not in the tomb 
because of an emotional feeling about it. I have an emotional feeling about the fact that he's not in the tomb. There's, there is, there is a, a great amount of emotion that flows from a godly ethic. Whereas a lot of times a value that deviates from God's moral ethic is something that begins with how I feel about something emotionally. And so we begin to come to, to our, uh, what we would call our ethical conclusions, but are really our own personal values based on our feelings. Uh, for example, perhaps I value my autonomy, uh, libertarianism, uh, don't tread on me and that kind of stuff. And I, I want to be independent and I want to be my own person. And okay, I believe that freedom is a, is an ethic that we find within Scripture, that Jesus came to set us free, that freedom within the correct context is a godly thing. God came to free us. But when does, when does my value of that wanting to be independent or wanting to be free in that sense, wanting my free, when does it deviate? Well, it deviates when I don't submit to God. And so if my, if my seeking to be independent or free uh, keeps me from submitting to God, then my value system has then deviated from his ethic. Uh, just bring it down to uh, more of a, in a, a microcosm, what we're talking about this morning. Uh, a person who would not submit to their eldership. And the, um, you might say, the, the wise and spiritually mature conclusions that an eldership has come to. If we decide, you know what, I just want to kind of do what I want to do, then my, my desire to be free and to be autonomous has then deviated from God's ethic. Uh, and so in that way, we follow sometimes our own wisdom, our own physical desires, and we end up separating ourselves from what God values. In 1 Timothy 4, and that we looked at this this morning, um, 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 1, Timothy, uh, Paul says to Timothy, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. When we think of the conscience, sometimes we think of it in the terms of being seared that Something doesn't bother me anymore. But sometimes it is that the conscience gets molded by our environment and by the influences that we allow around us. There's a reason why half of young people are leaving the church. And it's, it's directly tied to two things that go together. It's parents that aren't raising them to have an absolute understanding of what is right and wrong, and they're allowing friends, and a lot of times, those within a secular progressive uh, school influence or academia to convince them of particular things, to, to mold their consciences into something. And so we can think of a seared conscience as not being sensitive to something, but also we can have influences that cause us to be sensitive to things maybe in the wrong way, or sensitive to things that God has not told us to be sensitive to. For, for instance, when I talk about the medium rare steak, there are some who would tell me that I'm a murderer because they have, they have allowed themselves to be influenced by those who would form their conscience in that way, to have that sort of a sensitivity. Paul is a great example of this conscience issue. And that conscience, just because we think something and our conscience is leading us that way, does not mean that it's right. Remember in Acts 22, he gave his first recount of his, or account, of his, um, of his conversion from Acts 9. In Acts 23, he's still there before the Jews, and here's what he says. Acts 23, verse 1. Looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life 
before God in all good conscience up to this day. Paul valued persecuting the church, sending them off to prison, having them killed. What he was doing was ethically wrong, even though he had a clear conscience about it. And so that's why it's vitally important for us to understand that just because I value something, even though my conscience is telling me that something is true, it doesn't mean that it is ethically correct. And so Paul was blind to God's desires, though he had a good conscience. And so he had to dismiss what he valued before and embrace God's standards or God's ethic. Another thing I want us to think about is this. My values need to be aligned with God's values. You might say, well, that's the same thing. Well, not exactly the same thing. One is about how we like to determine our own ethics. But then we take a step, a step in our growth from that to seeking to align ourselves with the values or ethics of God. God has these, these absolute ethical norms or positions, you might say. And when we embrace those, they have a way of refining our value system. The more we get, the more we get into this, the more we have our minds wrapped around what God's absolute ethic is, he helps us to shed ourselves of values that are potentially harmful and potentially ungodly. I just want to look at one, one particular thing. Within the valley, there is a particular valley culture, wouldn't you say? But there's also, there's also a culture clash here. There are different cultures that find themselves sometimes enjoying each other and sometimes at friction with each other. You find that in various places. I find this to be kind of a special place where we have this in, in the sense that we're kind of in a unique place, at least in, in this nation. That we have this, we have a distinct culture and yet we have, if you can, if you're honest with yourself, you can kind of spot different types of cultural positions or cultural norms that different people have that live within the valley. And when we say like on a mission trip or something, when we go and visit somewhere, or even even when I, I'll tell you, when I go when I go back and visit home and visit Alabama, I, I can't I can barely understand them. The, there's just a completely different culture there. Uh, I can understand Bill better than I can understand them. But we have sometimes we go to places and we have a culture shock. Um, living here. It's not as much of a culture shock to go to Central America. But let me tell you, it's a culture shock to go to Africa. It's just completely different. It's not, it's, our value systems are some different. The cultures are different. And a lot of times when something pushes us a little bit out of our comfort zone, um, what happens is, is we can elevate our value system. It's not an ethic. It's just a value system. Well, these are the things that I value. You know, for instance, uh, someone tried to get me to to eat tongue one time, and I, I wouldn't do it. Or menudo, and they get menudo just to spite me, and they sit they sit uh, uh, upwind from me so that it, it so that I have to smell it. And I, okay, they can eat that. That's fine. Okay, these aren't ethical issues, but a lot of times because we have cultural conflict, what can happen is is we can begin to elevate our value system to an ungodly place, or we can we can almost elevate it to a place of ethics. Now, I will say this, that, I, that if we're honest about with ourselves and we look at each of the cultures around the world, there are some aspects of different cultures that are closer to godliness and farther away from godliness. If we're honest with ourselves, it's true. And we have to be honest about whatever culture we find ourselves in or whatever culture is our own comfort zone and then understand that the, the culture that we really need to be comfortable in or strive for is the Christian culture. And that that's really the only one that matters. But, but because we find, especially here, and there are other places where you find s sort of a clash, there can be times where we treat people or think of people in ungodly ways just because their cultural norms are different than ours. 
I've heard this sort of uh, discussed and sort of an accusation throughout my life of people that would go to under other countries as missionaries and bring Christianity to them, bring Christianity to a particular area. And and there's some there's some truth to this, but it's not always this way. That there are people that would go there and they would try to establish an Americanized way of doing things or a particular way that they need to do things when within their culture there may be a way of doing things that's totally fine with God's ethic but maybe out of the comfort zone of the way that we would do things. But to tell someone that they would have to do things according to you might say an Americanized Christianity well that would be elevating our value system into the place of ethics which would be an ungodly thing to do. And then we may begin to look down our noses at them or think, uh, think evil of them because we are elevating our values in a way that we shouldn't. Uh, if to do that would be the same as Jewish Christians demanding that Gentiles have to adopt the Jewish culture in order to be Christians. Now, I went for this particular example because I think it's easy for us to understand and because there's a direct connection in Scripture to this. Because when, when uh, in Galatians chapter 2, we find Paul talking about how Peter, he would treat the Gentile Christians a particular way, then when the Jewish Christians showed up, he would treat them a different way. In Galatians 2, starting in verse 11, Paul says this, he says, When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party or, or fearing the Jews. The rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. What did Peter value? Uh, did Peter value maybe his culture? Uh, did he value his reputation amongst Jewish Christians? What was motivating him to act in an ungodly way? It was tied to his value system. It wasn't tied to God's ethic. I'm not going to, to assign a particular reason to it, but whatever it, it was, it was something that he should not have done. He treated those differently. And so how does Paul confront him. And this is what's key to it. Paul confronts him with the truth of the gospel. Another way of stating it, he confronts him with, with he confronts them uh, with him with the specifics of God's ethics. Continuing in verse 14, here's how Paul confronts him. He says, but when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, it wasn't aligned with God's ethic. I said to Cephas, to Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Verse 17, but if in, in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I, re if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For, though the, for, for through the law, excuse me, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And so they were so tied to Judaism and their Jewish traditions, their Jewish culture. That's how Acts 15 starts. That's why I believe that, uh, that Galatians was written before Acts 15 is because this hasn't been hashed out yet. Or at least the events of this happened before Acts 15. Acts 15. And the fact that Paul didn't mention it in this passage tells me that this was written before Acts 15. That's just my opinion. Because in Acts 15, the first verse says what? There was a controversy about what? The Jewish traditions. They had a value system that they were seeking to impose on others, but it wasn't in line with God's ethic, and it was causing them to think and to act ungodly towards other people. 
You think about what the Word of God does for us in aligning and molding our consciences and our ethical stances. Psalm 119, 105 and 133, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. We have to let it guide us or to mold the way that we think, to mold our morality. Psalm 19, starting verse 7, talking about the power of God's word within the individual he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, the more than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And so we need to be open, be teachable to having our value system molded and aligned to what God values, what his ultimate absolute ethic has been established to be. Which brings me to this, this last point here is really just to get our minds going, just to challenge us a little bit. What, what do I value? What do I value? Because that really every day is the choice. Do I value what God values or do I value something else? Do I value the opposite? Do I value my, my opinions and my wisdom or do I value God's opinions and, and his wisdom? Isaiah 55, 9, For as the heavens are high, higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.20, pairing it up with that, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And so what do we value more? Because there are a lot who are allowing those whose wisdom is in opposition to God, they're allowing those value systems to mold their value systems. Are we allowing God's wisdom and his values to mold us. What about our desires? Do I value what I value or what I desire or what God desires? We, we, we may answer this quickly and say, well, I value what God desires. But if we're really honest with ourselves, what are the things that we have difficulty letting go of? Or the things that we like to kind of put ahead of what God would really want from, from us? In 1 John 2, 16 and 17, we find the, the end of the passage that we started with. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with, with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So what do I value? Do I value something that's temporary? Do I value something that is that has an eternal, intrinsic value to it? Talking about our culture, do I value what, what I'm used to and what's comfortable for me? Or do I elevate in my mind the Christian culture, the way that things are supposed to be done among the church? You know, Paul talked about this in Philippians 3, talking specifically about his culture. And this, this goes right into what we're talking about with, with Peter, elevating what his cultural background is, his values were, and treating Gentiles in an ungodly way, Paul says that this is the mental inventory and the mental steps that he had to go through. Philippians 3, starting in verse 4, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, I'm circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, as to zeal, a, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless, but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or garbage in order that I may gain Christ. So do we value what we are comfortable with or what we're used to? Or do we value what God wants us to be like? Do I value my plan or God's plan? We struggle with that sometimes making our way and making, making plans for the future. Jeremiah 10, 23, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Have you felt like you really needed to be in control? Instead of, instead of trusting God's control, you've been insisting on your will and on your plan instead of being open to God working out his plan. What about 
this life. The great things, look, we can all accomplish really great things. There, there are people that are doing amazing things. I mean, there's a, there's a guy that has electric cars and shoots rockets into the air and is a billionaire. And that's, you know, people do amazing things, right? But do we value this life more than we value our own soul? We have to be honest with ourselves. Matthew 16, starting verse 25. Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange or for return for his soul? How much weight, how much value are we putting on what we can accomplish in this life rather than what eternity holds for us? Finally, we value this world or we value... We value Christ. Matthew 10, starting in verse 32, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. That really challenges us to make a decision if we haven't, to, to wake up to the reality that, that God has set certain things as ultimately valuable. And those things are the foundation of our morality. They are our ethics. They are godly ethics. And they involve making a choice and conforming ourselves and submitting to the mind of God and the wisdom of God as opposed to everything that the world is trying to convince us is valuable. This is just sort of, a, you might say, a kickoff, an introductory, um, not a series, but this lesson is a, an introductory lesson, you might say, on the idea of the difference between values and ethics. I encourage you to continue to meditate on this yourself and to work through this on your own, to challenge the things that you value, that you have an emotional tie to, things that are a conscience issue for you, and evaluate those things in light of God's word and let his ethical absolutes mold your mind and mold your conscience and mold the things that you value. Perhaps there's someone today uh, who hasn't embraced the value that God has for you. One of the ethics is that you have an ultimate value, that you are an image bearer of God. He created you in his image and that he sent his son to die for you. That's the kind of value he has on you. And most people do not value themselves the way that God values them. Do you value yourself the way that he does to the extent that you will allow him to show you how much he values you in redeeming you by the blood of Christ? Maybe you need to become a Christian. Maybe you need to confess him as Lord as he said, and he'll confess you before the Father. Maybe you need to submit to him in giving your life and abandoning the things that you value in order to embrace things that he values. Maybe you need to be baptized into Christ today so that his blood can wash away your sins. You know, BJ's got a song for us. He's going to lead. This is an appropriate time if you need to share something, uh, maybe something that is a vulnerable thing, something that is personal, something that's a struggle, but something that you need to bring to your, your spiritual family so that we can help you deal with it and bear it or maybe work through it. Maybe there's sin you need to confess. Maybe you need to turn back to God. This is a great time where we can surround you, pour our love out on you, pray for you, support you. If there's something you need, please come as we stand and sing this song.